In this lecture, we are going to talk about postural deviations. So posture is the position of the body and the parts of the body in relation to one another. Uh, it is not strictly like, you know, sitting up nice and straight and tall. When we talk about posture, that's what a lot of people think of. Uh, but posture is just a word to describe any position of the body and where the different parts of the body are relative to one another. Uh, so main, maintaining posture requires a series of dynamic actions and muscle contractions. And there's no such thing as a single perfect posture. Um, so we might talk about like sit up straight and have good posture, but good posture is different for different people. There's no such thing as one single perfect posture. And that's also very individual, so different for different people and specific to whatever the task is. So there might be a better pos one posture that is better for one activity and a different posture that's better for a different activity, even within the same individual. So posture can be abnormal or injurious. Okay, so posture, although there's no perfect, precise posture, um, that doesn't mean all postures are okay. Some postures can be abnormal and can be harmful and hurt someone. Um, it can cause or involve increased muscular activity. So we have muscles that are contracting at a higher level than they should be or than they normally are. Uh, it'll cause increased stress on joints and tissues. And it can cause all kinds of different dysfunctions. So different things that will cause pain or other abnormal movements or uh, inability to complete tasks um, or it could sit somebody out from their sport, you know, so it could cause lots of different dysfunctions. Uh, so posture can affect or be affected by injuries or dysfunctions. Okay, so a poor posture, an abnormal posture might cause the increased muscular activity, the stress in the joints, the dysfunction, or those things could be caused by something else and be the root of the bad posture. Um, so it can be really difficult, sometimes impossible, to know which one came first. Um, it can be really hard to say, did the poor posture cause these problems or did these problems cause the poor posture? In some cases, it might be very obvious, like there was a car accident or an athletic injury or there might be some obvious cause of dysfunction that led to poor posture or abnormal posture. Uh, but in many cases, it's very difficult to tell which one came first. Um, so movement of one segment causes movement at adjacent segments within a kinetic chain. Uh, it's called regional interdependence. Uh, so neighboring joints are interdependent. Um, so we don't have function of one joint that is totally isolated from function of the neighboring joints. That doesn't happen. That's impossible. All of our joints are interdependent. Um, the different regions of the body are interdependent. So function of one de partially determines function of the neighbors. Uh, so movement of adjacent joints within a kinetic chain is often predictable. Um, so very often it happens the same way in, in different people that we have a movement at one joint that causes movement at this joint, a movement at that joint, a movement at that joint. Um, so very often we have predictable patterns in movements or compensations that happen um, pretty much the same in a lot of different people. Uh, so here's an example is when we have um, hyperpronation of the talocural joint, okay? or hyperpronation, I should say, of the ankle, because that includes um, dorsiflexion of the talocural, it includes movement of the subtalar and the forefoot of the foot. Um, so if we go into maximum ankle pronation, that includes talocural dorsiflexion. That will also cause the tibia to rotate internally, the tibiofemoral joint to flex, the acetabulofemoral joint to then internally rotate and flex. Okay, so you can see that starting with just simple ankle pronation, that now we have abnormal postures or movements of all of the joints going up the entire chain. And here I stopped at the hip, but we also would probably have a change in our motion of the sacroiliac joint, which will change the mobility of the lumbar spine. Um, so it's entirely possible that someone is hyperpronating and that's causing low back pain, 
just as one example. Um, so these types of movements in the different uh, kinetic chains of the body uh, tend to happen in the same way in lots of different people, which is convenient because when we're assessing them, uh, very often we can follow the chain all the way back to what the root of the problem really is. So in that case, they might not, the person who's hyperpronating and has low back pain, they might not have any dysfunction all the way up the whole limb, anything that they can identify or any pain that they're feeling, um, and all they have is the low back pain. But if you do a good postural assessment and observe that this is happening all the way up the chain, starting with the hyperpronation, then you know that correcting the hyperpronation is how you're going to help improve the low back pain. If a segment moves abnormally, then other joints in the kinetic chain must move abnormally to compensate. Okay, so for a joint to move appropriately the way it's supposed to, uh, we need the other neighboring joints to also move appropriately the way they're supposed to. So when we start moving incorrectly, for whatever reason it might be, uh, that forces the other neighboring joints to also move incorrectly, like we just saw on the last slide. The brain learns the new patterns. So when we've been doing that for a little while, the brain learns the new patterns and starts to think that it's moving the correct way, that that's how we're supposed to move, that that was the original pattern that we're trying to move. And your brain stops recognizing that this is an incorrect way to move and that we should be trying to fix it. So it starts to just feel normal and natural. Um, and then it takes some external observation takes somebody to assess them or a coach to notice or whatever it might be uh, to realize that they're moving in an abnormal way that should be corrected. Um, the new pattern that is established and that the brain now thinks is correct may or may not be a problem. So in some cases we could have a new pattern um, that is different from the original pattern that the person might be using because they're compensating because something hurt or they're doing something uh, strange that they they started into a new pattern. Um, but the new pattern might not be a problem. It might not uh, be causing any kind of pain or dysfunction or muscle imbalance, or it might be. Um, so it can go either way. So just because someone has changed how they're moving doesn't always mean that that's a bad thing. Um, but that's generally how the bad movement patterns begin initially. It's just, I'm not saying that all the new movement patterns are always wrong. I included this picture here just because um, hairdressers, I've had a lot of hairdresser clients over the years who um, have kind of the same set of issues where they're in a posture like this guy is here, uh, where they're kind of hunched over, arms in front, and they're they're in kind of poor postures for long uh, stretches of the day, working on you know <laughs> whatever grooming that is that they do, um, and so it's just another example of where some people are in very stereotypical patterns that um, kind of wreak havoc on their posture. Uh, so there are three common ways that compensations occur. So there are three main ways that we compensate for some kind of abnormal movement or injury or dysfunction. Uh, the first one is counterbalance. So that's when the person shifts part of the body in the opposite direction of the other or of another thing. Uh, so like if we look at this picture, the guy on the left here, where he's got that left shoulder that's depressed, that left shoulder is dropped, that right shoulder is elevated, it's a little bit high. So when that left shoulder is dropped, instead of the head tilting towards the left, he's counterbalancing by leaning the head towards the right. Okay, so that's an example of counterbalance. That left shoulder is going down, it's dropping, so the head's moving to the right to counterbalance it. Another way that we compensate is when we have hypomobile joints, so not enough mobility, that causes adjacent joints to become hypermobile, too much mobility to make up for it. Uh, so a really good example of that is uh, the intervertebral joints in the spine. Uh, let's say we have one of the intervertebral joints in the spine is hypomobile. It's not enough mobility, it's too stiff or restricted. Uh, that causes the next intervertebral joint, or the ones above and below, to become hypermobile to make up for the lack of mobility at that level. 
Okay. And so we see that in lots of different places in the body. Um, so like if we have not enough hip mobility, that forces us to have more spinal mobility and vice versa. Um, so to achieve the same full body mobility and be able to achieve the same tasks, we need a certain amount of mobility and range of motion of joints. So whenever it's restricted in one place, we make up for it in the neighboring joints. And so hypermobility, you know, as much as hypomobility can be painful or, or you know, uncomfortable or bad for us, not enough mobility, hypermobility is equally problematic. So we're taking one problem of hypomobility and transferring that to create more problems of hypermobility in neighboring joints. Uh, the third way that compensations generally happen is we have a change in muscle activation or muscle activity. Um, so we'll have muscles that are chronically shortened or hyper, um, hypertonic, so they have too much muscle tone, too much uh, muscle activity, and we'll have muscles that are hypotonic or chronically lengthened and not enough um, muscle activity. Um, so we want things to be, we want our muscles to be uh, activating proportionately depending on, you know, not all muscles need to be activated equally, they need to be proportionate. Uh, so that we have the right amount of forces being produced at different joints at different times to achieve our tasks and to maintain our postures. Um, and so when we have muscles that are activating less than they should be or more than they should be or disproportionate to one another at a joint, um, then we start to have some real pain and dysfunction there. Okay, a distortion pattern. It's a pattern of dysfunctions or compensations. So the whole pattern is what we would call the distortion pattern uh, when we look at the whole body. So it emerges from a combination of primary and secondary distortions. So a primary distortion would be an initial problem in a specific area of the body. So that could be an initial problem like from a car accident or um, it could be like an overuse injury from a sport or an activity that someone's participating in. Uh, so a primary distortion, that would be the initial problem uh, that is causing other problems. Or like our example earlier, it could be the hyperpronation at the ankles. That would be the primary distortion that is causing a secondary distortion at the lumbar spine. That's a problem or compensation that occurs in response to the primary distortion. So maybe the primary distortion is the person dropping that left shoulder and the secondary distortion would be tilting the head to the right side to compensate for that, to counterbalance. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier, it can be very difficult to figure out which problems came first. Um, it can be very hard to tell which distortions are the primary distortions and which are secondary that were in, as a result of the primary distortion. Uh, sometimes it's obvious because they had a car accident or an injury or something where there's a very obvious primary distortion and then everything else that's happening is in response to that. Those would be secondary distortions. But sometimes these things creep on over time and multiple distortions can sort of uh, develop over time kind of together. Uh, so it could be very hard to tell which ones came first. In some cases, it really matters. Like if they had a car accident and they had very specific injuries caused by that car accident, it's important to address those injuries. And that's also going to help uh, solve the other secondary distortions that happened as a result of that primary distortion. Um, but if, if it's a case where you can't really tell which came first, then it's probably not that important which came first. If you can't figure out which came first because they seem to have developed together, then we need to address them together to help resolve all of those distortions and the overall distortion pattern. Okay, so that's all I have for you in this video today. Thanks for watching. See you for the next one.